Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Incarnation. Glad you're here with us on this Easter morning. If you are a first-time guest, know that this is the kind of service we have every week with all this music. Uh, and so we, anyways, we are so delighted you're here with us today celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My name is Joel. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're worshiping with us online, thank you for being a part of our community as well. It's good to have you here too. As we begin our worship service today, we have this sincere hope that you will experience the love of God through the music, through the words that are spoken. And as a way to begin that, we invite you just to sit and be drawn into this day through this first song. She stands alone beside an empty grave Tears of a broken woman on her face Somebody took the one she loved away He saw the beautiful beneath the scars The hidden treasure in her broken heart so empty now because the Savior's gone. Then a voice says, don't you cry. It is I. Go tell the world that I'm alive. I'll never leave you. I'll be by your side. Go tell the world that I'm alive Just like that woman by an empty grave I've done so many things that made me feel ashamed I don't feel worthy of the call he gave I invite you to please stand in body or in spirit. Now hear these words from the book that we love in Matthew, the 28th chapter. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. 
His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Friends in Christ, let all the world know that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us sing together. Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life, now and through all the ages. Give us grace to experience the goodness of your life in our daily lives. Send us encouragement to share that life with others, so all may be filled with your love and grace. Amen. You may be seated.
Wright, who is a theologian and biblical scholar who writes a lot of different things, has this to say about the resurrection. The resurrection completes the inauguration of God's kingdom. It is the decisive event demonstrating that God's kingdom really has been launched on earth as it is in heaven. The message of Easter is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ and that you're now invited to belong in it.
man, music's just the way to tell the story, isn't it? I mean, if there's any way to sort of capture the energy of it, I think music just makes it so, come so alive. A little backstory for us this week. Um, our primary organist, Amy Mockestead, on Tuesday, I think it was, or Wednesday, uh, notified us that she had COVID. Ugh. So hard for her because she'd been prepping, of course, to, to make this happen for weeks. Uh, she do, is going to do a piece of the Vitor's Toccata. So if any of you know what organ music is all about, uh, you know what I mean, how hard that piece it is, but it's just an electric thing. She's going to do it for the post. Man, she was so pumped. So we're bummed for her. But I do, I say that to acknowledge some people who had to step in and do some really fine work. And Sean Turner, you want to just go over. <laughs> Luann Reese. And here's who I missed, our piano player, our accompanist. Get a, give me a name, I just missed that. We're so glad that you were here. Thank you very much. So I think we're here to celebrate, I mean, what we might as well just call it a miracle, right? I mean, I think this, this day is all about miracles. I mean, there's been now two days in a row where it's been 60 degrees in Minnesota. <laughs> I mean, let's just talk about it. Let's, we'll just say the Minnesota miracle, whatever it is. But that's, a, I mean, the resurrection happened, I know. But <laughs> two days in a row at 60 degrees, how fantastic is that? Um, okay, we'll get back to the resurrection. Uh, so, what a mystery. What do we really do with this whole story about a person who came embodying supposedly who God was, died on a cross, raised a couple of days later? I mean, the, just the, the mysterious nature of that story is so much, how do you even wrap your arms around it? One of the, the, the ways that I've kind of simplified it in my own mind, and this has been helpful for me, if it's helpful for you, great, um, is that I think about the resurrection is God's yes to everything that was revealed in the person of Jesus. I think it's about it's God's yes to everything that was revealed in the person of Jesus. And so I think there's that, there's that great phrase that people know in the context of the Christian church that where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Unfortunately, what's happened often during our, uh, throughout the years is that that phrase has been used to batter people because they don't believe the same things that I believe, and so you've got to really know the way like I know them. I think Jesus meant something completely different than that. Here's what I think he meant. I think he meant this. I am the way to discover the truth about life. I think that's what he meant, that Jesus is the way that we discover the truth about what our life can be. And so we have to examine as closely as we can the stories about Jesus, and we have to kind of watch his interactions with people, and we have to understand who is offended by Jesus and who is turned on by Jesus and his message. This, we have to do this very intentionally and very closely to, for us to understand what is this way of life that we are to discover so that we can then participate as fully in it as we can. Jesus himself defined a central piece of it. When he washed the feet of his disciples, he said, I want you to love one another as I have first loved you. And then he went on and used this phrase. He said, um, by this, everyone will know that you are my followers if you have that kind of love for one another. Love was the defining image for Jesus about what he brought to reveal, not only about the God of the universe, but also the life that we are invited to participate in. Paul, who was one of the early leaders of the church, has probably one of my favorite texts in scripture. He asked this question, well, what then can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ? And Paul goes on and he says, well, nothing, not one thing. Because of the resurrection not, the resurrection, not life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. That is the cornerstone of who we are. That is God's yes that we experience, I think, in the resurrection. So if you're a guest with us today, 
uh, I hope you experience a little bit about the love of God, that you just sort of sense in the community that you're a part of right now, that you sense in the interactions that we have, you sense in the words, the music that's there, that there is, there is some creative energy of God that continues to want to find its way into this world and, and into, I think, each of our lives in its own unique way. And so I hope you experience some of that today because that, in a sense, is God's yes to, for the resurrection. So we're going to be moving into a sermon series entitled Awe. You see the screen behind you, Awe, A-W-E. And uh, the idea came from a book I picked up uh, a couple of months ago uh, by that same title, Awe. And the subtitle was The New Science of How Everyday Wonder Can Transform Your Life. The New Science of How Everyday Wonder Can can Transform Your Life. And so as uh, the author goes through and describes then what awe is, he says this, awe is the emotion that we have when we encounter vast mysteries that we cannot fully explain. Awe is the emotion that we have when we encounter vast mysteries that we cannot fully explain. So, so what does awe do? It, it, by nature, it just sort of pulls us out of ourselves, right? If we can explain it, we can stay in this space. But it pulls us out of ourselves and allows us to engage the world, I think, more fully. Awe is that emotion that helps us encounter the vast mysteries that we don't fully understand. So he went through and he studied all these different cultures and he came up with descriptors about what are the things that that entice or the other things pull out awe in people. Uh, One of the things he said was music, you know? And so we gather for worship and we experience this kind of music because there should be a part of that somewhere along the way where you just go, wasn't that awesome? He also talked about the created world as one of those uh, avenues Because the creative world, if we allow it, should put us in touch with things far beyond what we can imagine. Just far beyond what we can imagine. He talked about uh, uh, spiritual experiences that some people have, right? There's an experience that they can kind of put their hands around. They can't exactly sure why it happened to them or why it happened in their their community that they're part of. But there's some spiritual experience that, that brings a sense of awe that people have in their life. And he also talked about two different kinds of stories. And the first story was this, stories of life and death. So here we are in the resurrection. What do we do? We're telling the story about life and death and, of course, life again. He also said, and this was the, what what he said was the most consistent experience of awe across all the cultures that he analyzed. And the stories that were people were told were told of people's kindness, courage, and strength when we just told each other those stories of kindness and courage and strength, people reported that more than anything else as an experience of awe. It's sort of like, what does that do? It sort of draws you, I want to be a part of that. So if you think about the nature of awe, then it seems like it's a pretty quick and easy fit to the resurrection stories, isn't it? Let me take you back to the story that Joel read just a few minutes ago. Let me hit some pieces of it. What happens when uh, suddenly when they approach the tomb, there is a great earthquake. The natural world is experienced. And sometimes, of course, the natural world can be absolutely terrifying. Uh, Sometimes the natural world can be awe-inspiring. But there's a gift, there's a presentation of awe so far in that particular text. And then an angel appears, right? A a supernatural experience, something that they didn't anticipate could happen. And now they have to think even bigger. What is going on here? What is happening at this particular moment? It goes on and the angel announces them that Jesus has been raised from the dead. So what's that? It's a story of life and death and now new life again. And you can imagine just like layer upon layer upon layer, all of a sudden they're going, man, this is way bigger than I ever anticipated. At the end of it, what happens to them is that they leave the tomb quickly with fear It says, and great joy. I think both of those are awe words, right? We're kind of overwhelmed by the moment, and so we can be fearful because we don't anticipate what's really, or don't know for sure what's going on. But the great joy, I mean, I think awe is the thing that sort of elicits this sense of joy for us that we can experience more deeply in the world. And they went and told all the disciples. And if you think about it, 
In the end, what all of these resurrection stories are, are stories of strength and love and kindness and courage. And it's all that they really were armed with as they made their way into the world. All they had was this story. And what's really awe-inspiring, if you begin to think about it, is that we're sitting here 2,023 years later because people have told this story over and over again, and there's a sense for us that it's true because it hits us here. We've been drawn into a bigger story. So I want to take you through uh, a couple of images that we're just going to have and sort of let us pretend that we're engaging in a little awe exercise for us. First one is this one uh, that's up here. This is a picture taken by one of our staff people here at Incarnation when she was uh, on spring break in Florida. And she sent it to me, uh, I think, one of the days after we got 10 inches of snow. (laughs) So I was not inspired by awe. I was actually fairly bitter at the moment, um, but that was my own issue I had to get over with. Um, you've, You've dealt with experiences like this, I'm sure. You sort of walk up to a beach, and if you allow yourself, right, we can put on blinders and just sort of walk to the next place. But if if we allow ourselves, what's the experience like when we have encounters like this? There's there's a vastness, right, uh, of the ocean. There's the mystery of the the rhythms of it coming back and forth that provide this kind of rhythm of of life. There's this sort of luminous light sort of peeking through the clouds and and showing us something. And and we don't know, everyone would look at it and they'd sort of interpret it in their own way, but that's the beauty of it, isn't it? We're drawn out of ourselves and we have this moment of awe. And I think that's what the power of the resurrection is all about, getting us out of ourselves. Second picture, my sister was in uh, Barcelona, Spain a couple weeks ago and she went through uh, some of the cathedrals that were there and she sent uh, a text message to all her family and I think her description was something like this. You just walk into that place and it takes your breath away. You just go, ah, because you can't believe what went into creating that space. That's a sense of awe, isn't it? We're, we're lifted out of ourselves. We can kind of wrap our mind around, oh my gosh, what would it take to create this? And why? And how were people inspired to do it? Third picture, a little bit harder one to figure out, but I'll, I'll drop you in the context. After George Floyd was killed, uh, if you remember, they created a memorial around the site where it happened. And uh, maybe within a few weeks, I went down to the site, and a few things happened that day. One was... Um, it was eerily quiet for the hundreds of people that were making their way around. They just kept walking from place to place. There's not a lot of uh, noise that was happening. One, people were, you could tell that they were like parents who were trying to teach their kids about something that was going on in that space. Uh, There were other maybe friends or neighbors or family members who were just overwhelmed by the experience. What do we do with all of this? And so they were hugging each other as they made their way to each of the spots along the way. But right before I left, uh, I encountered this sign that for, with the words from James Baldwin. He said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I just thought to myself as I drove away, think about the kind of global reckoning that's going on right now and how hard it is for us to face things that are difficult and kind of push us to our own limits. And yet in situations like that, we're invited, right, out of ourselves to be able to participate in facing in order for things to be changed. One more picture. I had to throw dogs up there, right? You throw a few puppies up there and people go, oh my gosh, say say this for me. Aww. See, that's what happens when you see puppies, right? So this is at a pride parade uh, a number of years ago in Columbus, Ohio. And, uh, but you see awe for puppies, because who doesn't love a puppy? Um, but then you see the sign. And you become mindful that there are people in this world who don't experience a God of love because of people who are supposed to be living loving 
worlds, loving ways. And all of a sudden, just looking at that sign, you, if you allow yourself, your kind of image of God's love and how far it can expand is pressed, and it's a good thing, and it's a good thing. As I said earlier, one of the uh, consistent uh, con connections with awe are stories about li uh, life and death. And uh, this year is a particularly poignant one for me. Uh, last year, at this time, uh, my mother-in-law was here with us. She had come up from Columbus, Ohio, and it ended up being her last visit to St. Paul. And so we were here during Holy Week. She went to a number of the little services that I did at different places around the community. She took in all the Holy Week services, and, and she's this person of deep and beautiful piety and faith. And so she was just eating it up, and she sang, and she participated, and she just, you know, did whatever she could to be a part of this grand, big, huge story. Well, unfortunately, about uh, six weeks later or so, there's her cognitive decline just shifted dramatically, and we ended up having to put her into a memory care unit, and then two months ago, uh, she ended up dying. And so if you think about the concept of, of life and death and the vast mysteries, right, that you encounter, when, I mean, there are things that we just will never know uh, about that whole experience, even though we've tried to press in and tried to understand things. There's stuff that we're just never going to know. We have to kind of live into that space. Um, but one story has just stayed with me since it happened. Uh, we were there uh, a couple of nights before she ended up dying, and we were fat, gathered as a family uh, around her bed, and we sang songs, and we told stories, and we laughed, and we cried, and um, we were just simply being there and present as we could in the, in the grief of the moment. And into the room, this woman walks, and she kind of makes her way right into the circle, not invited. She just made her way right in through there and got all the way up uh, to my mother-in-law, and she put her hand uh, on her hand, and she said, Hey, Miss Artie, we love you. Hey, Miss Artie, we love you. And she just stood there for a while. We all thought that she was coming there to take a temperature or do something like that. But no, she just, stood, she just wanted to be present somehow in that moment with us. After a few more minutes, I kind of, she turned to me and I saw on her name tag, her name was, on her name tag, it was love. And I said, uh, now is that your name or are you just, like, is that your characteristic of life you want to emulate? And she said, no, that's my name. And I said, gosh, that's kind of a big name to live up to, isn't it? And we all laughed a little bit. And she said, oh, yeah, it is. And she just stayed present with us for a while there. Miss Artie, I love you. And then she walked away, and she lived up to her name. She lived up to her name in a beautiful way. Two days later, um, after my mother-in-law had died, we were gathering out in the lobby area, but in memory care units, there's, you're behind a locked door at that point, and you have to allow people uh, to let you out. And so we're waiting for someone to come and let us out uh, of that space, and guess who showed up? Love showed up. And uh, she unlocked the door, and then she threw her arm around my wife, and she began to lead us back to life. So there you have it. I kept thinking about this, like, this is Holy Week, right? Love enters the space of our grief and our struggle and our disappointments and our failures and everything else that we have, and love stays there and is present with us in that very moment. And there's a point along the way where love unlocks the door and begins to lead us back to life. Good Friday, what happened? This love embodied in Jesus took on everything that the world would have, the violence and the cruelty and everything else that happened on that Good Friday. Holy Saturday came, Easter Sunday came, what we celebrate this day, and there's this revelation of hope and love that happens because the doors of our grief were unlocked and we were led back into life. Now, friends, that's an awesome story. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing together.
with the whole people of God in Christ Jesus. Let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. As we pray each petition with the words, Lord, in your mercy, the congregation will respond, hear our prayer. Gracious God, you are the creator of the world, the liberator of your people, and the wisdom of the earth. Renew your church with the power of your Holy Spirit that we may have the kindness, strength, and courage to shine as your light and love in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Risen Christ, you are the good shepherd who calls us to feed and care for your people, the sheep of your pasture. Empower our efforts in giving and serving those who are hungry. We ask your blessing over the upcoming Feed My Starving Children mobile pack in our facility. May it bring hope to a hungry world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of comfort and mercy, you have called us to bear one another's burdens. Enable us to see others who are suffering in body, mind, and spirit, and to act to help where we can. We also ask for your presence for the people suffering the effects of war and violence, for the poor, oppressed, sick, bereaved and lonely for those we name in our hearts and minds in the silence now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of new life, we give you thanks for drawing us to you, the way to discover the truth about life through your Son, Thank you for the new beginnings and for the hope to be made alive in you. Free us from our fears and help us to claim the love, the assurance, and the peace you have given us to be Easter people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to receive the gift of Holy Communion. with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so, with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels and seraphim and cherubim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He broke it and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. 
Just a reminder that this is Christ's table and Christ is the host and that all are welcome, regardless of your denomination or if you're a visitor today or if you haven't been to communion in a long time. Christ welcomes all to this table. We celebrate communion here via intinction. We give you a host, and if you need a gluten-free one, indicate that to your server. You can then dip your host or the wafer into the cup, which is divided into two parts. The darker colored liquid is red wine. The lighter colored is white grape juice. And even if you'd like to come up and receive one of our uh, communion package, prepackaged cups, we encourage you to take one of those and bring it forward so that you may hear the words of the body and, body and blood of Christ given for you. We also believe that God is a generous God. And so we ask that you think about your offerings as you come forward. We have baskets if you'd like to um, make an offering or tithe at that time. Communion servants, please come forward. All has been prepared for you. See my hands and look at my feet It's okay if it's hard to believe time to go but before I leave go tell the world about me I was dead but now I live I've got to go now for a little while but good not the end don't forget the things that I taught you I've conquered death and I hold the keys where I go you will go to someday there's much to do here before you
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Just an announcement before you leave today, a reminder that we are coming up on our uh, annual Feed My Starving Children event, which is a mobile packing event that we host and we have done it for years. How many of you have participated in it in the past? It's um, fun for all ages, but it's also, more importantly, an important mission of feeding the hungry in heart, body, mind, and spirit. And so the food that's pack packaged here will require a lot of hands on deck. And so it's a great intergenerational opportunity if you have people in your family or relatives that you can gather up for that last week of April, we encourage you to go online and uh, step up to serve. And it'll be a, a great community builder as well as we'll be able to make a difference in feeding more than 1,500 children for over a year. So we invite you to participate in Feed My Starving Children. And if you have questions, make sure to visit with one of us following the service. At this time, I invite you to stand as you are able for our closing hymn. We're so glad you worshiped with us today. Thanks so much for coming. Receive this blessing. In wonder and awe, we experience the love of the risen Christ. With grace and humble service, we express Christ's love to the world. Thanks be to God. Happy Easter. We hope to see you soon. Mm -hmm.